We're going to be turning to Psalm 27 today. Psalm 27. We're going to be talking about worship. That's our subject matter. I'm going to read starting at verse 1, but we are going to focus almost entirely on verse 4. But we'll get some context by starting at verse 1. Psalm 27, starting at verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me, uttering slanders against me, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though a host encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. May God's blessing rest upon this portion of his holy word that we are going to focus on this morning. Being a Christian in today's world is a lot like joining a baseball team that plays all of its games in the other team's stadium. Do you feel that way sometimes as a Christian? No home games. The crowd always seems to be against you. It cheers your mistakes and it rejoices in your misfortunes. Your clutch hit or sparkling defensive play is greeted by stony silence. The fans are pledged to your defeat. And that's the way it feels sometimes being a Christian in today's world. And Jesus said it will be that way for he said, uh, we are not of this world. And so we have a song that sings, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. But we don't feel comfortable and at home in this world as Christians. And Jesus said, They are going to hate him, and if they hate him, they're going to hate us. And so that has quite often been the case where the world does not appreciate or love Christians. In verses 2 and 3, they describe these evildoers, people who are hostile to the kingdom of God, And so David says, when evildoers assail me and utter slanders against me, and that's happening today, just read the news. My adversaries and my foes, they stumble and fall. Though a host encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. So he's defining now his attitude, life in this world as a Christian. So when the evildoers assail us, and they are hostile to us in today's world, we need an uplift to our lives. We need something that will boost us up, something that will recharge us. We need excitement. We need energy. We need intense delight that comes from making contact with the Lord. And that comes in worship. That comes from coming to church and worshiping with other believers. I'm going to talk in a little bit about those who say, oh, I can worship God in the mountains. I don't have to go to church. We need this excitement that comes from being in church. We need this feel good all over feeling that comes from getting into God's word and with fellowship from other Christians. We need a sense of purity and freshness. We need a calm assurance which comes from knowing that all the pieces in this world do fit together in the kingdom of God. We need something that satisfies. We need worship. Christians need worship because worship is what makes us come alive in our Christian experience. And this is what God intended for us from the very beginning. Someone said, you Christians seem to have a religion that makes you miserable. You are like a man with a headache. 
He doesn't want to get rid of his head, but it sure hurts him to keep it. Worship is meant to be exciting. Worship is meant to be thrilling, to make us joyful. It is meant to give us a boost in our Christian lives. And so David, first of all, describes these evildoers in the world that are assailing believers. But then he goes right into verse 4, and he tells us how he asks the Lord for a few things. David is an expert on worship. He knows a thing or two about worship. And I think it would pay good dividends if we think about what David is telling us in verse 4. The joy of worship will be ours when we take this attitude of David. And the first thing that David mentions is determination because he begins by saying one thing. One thing have I asked of the Lord. Not two things, not 10 things, not 50 million things. He's not a multitasker, just one thing. How can we experience joyful worship unless we have the determination to worship? We need the attitude of David to focus on just one thing when we come into the house of the Lord, and that is worship. David refused to be consumed by his many duties as king, and even in those days, kings had many duties. There were constant demands on his time, but he refused to be consumed by his many duties, and he chose to make God his number one priority as king. And this single-mindedness made him a great leader. We could learn a thing or two about single-mindedness in today's world. One thing, David says, if you could ask God for just one thing, what would you ask of him? Just one thing. God told Solomon, I will give you one thing. And what did Solomon ask for? He asked for wisdom, didn't he? That made him a wise man to begin with, didn't it? To ask for wisdom. What would you ask for if God was to give you just one thing? Would you ask for somebody to be healed? Would you ask for somebody to be saved? Would you ask for financial security? Would you ask for uh, money? Success for David to know God deeply was his great desire. To know God intimately and to know God passionately. This was his one thing. David is determined. Great people are just ordinary people with great determination. Are you a great Christian? Have you got this determination, this one thing? Determination is the only thing that will get us out of bed in the morning and over to the church on time. That's determination. And some Christians have more determination than others because some Christians drift into church five minutes late, 10 minutes late, 20 minutes late, because there are other things on their mind and they are not determined by one thing, and that is worship on Sunday morning, getting to the church on time. Determination must be stronger than the lures of the world, stronger than laziness, stronger than hard times. We need determination in order to worship the Lord. I remember my determination when I was inducted into the Air Force and I went down to Lackland and they had us in formation and finally they gave us a little rest, a little reprieve from what we were doing and the drill sergeant said, all right, light them up if you've got them. I came from a Christian home. I'd never lit one up in my life. But I recognized that I was no longer in the Christian environment. I was in the world. 
And that very first time the drill sergeant said, light them up if you've got them, I made a determination that I was not going to light my first cigarette. I was not going to take my first drink. And if you can't take the first one, you can't take any others, can you? I made that determination that I would not say my first swear word. Determination got me through four years of the Air Force life. Four years totally in the world without much church. But because of determination, I was able to do that. We need the same kind of determination in worship. We've got to make a, a pact with ourselves that worship is going to be important enough that we're going to get to the church on time. James in chapter 1, verses 6 through 8 says, Let him ask in faith with no doubting, <clears throat> For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that a double-minded man, a man with no determination, he is not going to receive anything from the Lord. If we can't make up our mind, if we can't be determined, how can we expect much from the Lord? I know and I recognize that we all belong to the society of divided hearts. Sometimes we can't make up our mind. We're like the mule that starved to death between two haystacks because he couldn't make up his mind which haystack to eat from. And we are not determined sometimes. But when it comes time to worship, let us be determined. A joyful worship experience awaits us if we are determined, if we allow just this one thing to occupy our minds. And so David begins with determination. He continues by mentioning his desire next. One thing have I asked of the Lord. Who asked for a joyful experience in worship when you came to church this morning? I'm, I'm just curious, how many of us prayed for a joyful experience in worship or prayed for a good worship experience when we came to church? Or did we just know, well, it's time to go, let's go, we got there. And we didn't think much about our worship time. How does that describe you? Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. Did you ask the Lord for a great worship experience when you came to church this morning? You have not because you ask not. Jesus said, ask and it will be given you. Why don't we ask? I notice in that statement of asking, there are two parts. There is the human side, the asking, and there is the divine side, the giving. Now, how can we receive because God wants to give if we don't ask in the first place? Ask and you will be given to you. You have not because you ask not. In our first church, Jenny and I had our first child. This first child was coming up and we saw it was a small church and we were in charge of about everything on Sunday morning. And we just prayed for the Lord to let the baby come on Monday instead of Sunday. <laughs> and so that's what we did. We prayed for the child to be born on Monday. And Sunday came and my wife was great with child, but she sat at the organ and she played all the way through the service. And we had the sermon and we had the benediction. And then Sunday night at midnight... My wife said, I think it's time. And we went into the hospital. And the baby was born Monday morning at 1020 in the morning. We asked for it. We asked for it to be that way. And we had all week to prepare for next Sunday. And we were up on that platform with baby in a basket on the platform <laughs> the next Sunday. But we were happy because we asked for that. And the Lord blessed us 
and honored that request. Some Christians are just happy to be alive. Wanting nothing, they ask for nothing, or what they ask for is so trivial. Survey after survey says that nine out of 10 Christians, uh, not Christians, people, Christians or not Christians, nine out of 10 people have no definite plan in life. They just float along waiting for things to happen and then they respond to the emergencies. They are content with whatever comes along, wanting nothing, they ask for nothing. After the Babylonian captivity, God told Israel in Babylon that he would fulfill his promise and that he would bring them back to Jerusalem and he would give them a future and a hope. And so God told Jeremiah the prophet who wrote, then you will call upon me and come to me and pray to me and I will hear you. Ask and you will receive. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And that applies to Sunday morning. Do we ask on Sunday morning for a good worship experience? The promise is if we ask with all of our heart, we will find. David had one real desire and he let it be known to the Lord. David continues by mentioning decision. He says, that will I seek after. Not this other thing, but that. He wants to be in the house of the Lord. He wants to have a great worship experience in the house of the Lord. After getting this one idea in mind and asking the Lord about it, David makes up his mind to go after it. Now let's look in verses 8 and 9. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to thee, thy face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not thy face from me. Turn not thy servant away in anger. Thou who hast been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. He's asking for the Lord, isn't he? He's made this decision to seek after the Lord. Decide what you want and then go after it. Do you want a great worship experience on Sunday morning? That's a decision that you must make and that you must go after. The Lord is willing to answer. Are we as willing to ask? A famous layman decided when he became a new Christian that he would be in church every Sunday and he would tithe regularly. And he found that after he made that decision, he didn't have to decide every Sunday whether to go to church or not. It was a foregone conclusion he was going to go to church. And when the offering was mentioned in the church service, he didn't have to decide whether he was going to give an offering or not. That was a foregone conclusion because he had already decided. You know, it's so much easier to make one decision and stick by it then have to redecide every week. That will I seek after. That's a decision. Having made this decision, he was saved the bother of deciding every Sunday, shall I go to church today? And if so, how much shall I give? And he got a lot more joy out of his faith life. We will get a lot more joy out of our Christian life if we just make up our mind and then we enforce that decision. Joyful worship comes along this way. David said, one thing have I asked of the Lord and that thing will I seek after. One thing people, that's a description, one thing people, they know what they want and they are determined to get it. Are we that determined when we worship? What is that one thing that David seeks? 
He describes it next by the word destination. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord. This is the way David wants to go. This is his purpose. This is his goal. This is his leaning. This is the direction of his life. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord. The Hebrew word for dwell means dwell. It's translated that way 437 times in the King James Version. It's translated inhabit 221 times. And it is translated sit 172 times. That I may dwell, inhabit, or sit in the house of the Lord. For an Old Testament saint, this meant to come into God's presence. Because in the Old Testament, God was more localized. He was in the temple. And so if you wanted to experience God, you went to the temple. And there, you felt like God was there. Because God promised that he would be in the temple. He would be in the Holy of Holies. In, uh, at first, the tabernacle which David built. And so for the Old Testament saint, it meant go to the tabernacle where he could have this intimate spiritual fellowship with God. David does not say, go to the mountains. He does not say that I may go to the beach to fellowship with a God there. He says that I may go to the house of the Lord. For David, it was the tabernacle. Yes, we can worship anywhere. Jesus himself told the woman at the well, God is a spirit and we can worship God anywhere. Ah, but do we? When we go to the beach, is that a worship experience with God or is that a worship experience with nature? When we go to the mountains, is that a real worship experience with God or are we just dwelling in nature? Jesus always went to the synagogue. Short history lesson. David had to go to the tabernacle because the temple wasn't built yet. God told David he could not build the temple. He gave that chore to Solomon. Solomon in all of his glory built a wonderful temple. And then for years and years, Israel worshiped at the temple because that's where God was. Every Jew had to make several destination trips to the temple each year to meet God in the temple. But the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And when Jesus was on earth, the temple was in Jerusalem, but they had already established synagogues in all the other cities. And when Jesus was not in Jerusalem at the temple, he went every week to the synagogue. So we read in Luke chapter 4, Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and he went to the synagogue as his custom was on the Sabbath day. It was a custom. You see, Jesus had decided to go every Sabbath to the synagogue or to the temple if he was in Jerusalem. A follower of Jesus should follow Jesus' example. If Jesus made that decision to go every week to the temple or to the tabernacle or to the synagogue, shouldn't we decide to be in God's house every week? That was the custom that Jesus followed. And then after the ascension, after Jesus went up into heaven and left his disciples on earth, <clears throat> the disciples in Luke chapter 24 were continually in the temple blessing God. They made that their habit. They decided that they would go every week to the temple. Hebrews 10.25 says, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. And we know for a fact that there are Christians who have a habit of dropping out from church and only going maybe once or twice a month. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. There's a benefit of coming to church. We encourage one another. Jesus himself surely intended that we go regularly 
for worship. In fact, look at his model prayer. Our Father which art in heaven. That's his model prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but it was a model prayer for his disciples. And notice in that prayer, he says, our Father, our bread, our debts, thinking together. That it's a corporate experience. It's not an individualistic experience like we like to have in today's society. We are such individualists, we'll do it ourselves. But the Lord wants us to gather for worship. And so he prays a model prayer for us to be together. The church is the body of Christ. And those who follow Jesus apart from the church are attempting to follow the head without a body. A head without a body. That's how many Christians practice their faith. A head without a body. Cor corporate worship is a part of God's plan for history. In Revelation chapter 5, there is this picture of the, the uh, throne room in heaven where all the angels are worshiping God. And we read, I heard every creature, not some creatures, not those that decided to go, but every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all therein, saying to him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. That's where we're headed, folks. We're headed to the throne room where we are going to worship God forever and ever if we are Christians. Have you ever known a person quite well? And then you met the family of that person. Isn't it amazing how much we can learn from the family? Uh... Just last week, Keith and Debbie sang a song, My Father's Eyes. And when we meet the family, we say, oh, he has his father's eyes or he has his mother's features or he speaks like his brothers and sisters. So from the family, we can learn a lot more about this person that we thought we knew so well. And so it is with God. By coming to the house of the Lord, we are with the family of God. And when we meet with the family of God, we, we learn more about our God, about the Son, Jesus Christ. And worship gets more exciting. David continues on by talking about duration. All the days of my life, he says, there is no retirement age in worship. Worship is not like a trial marriage. It's not something we can just try on or have a trial run or a dry run. It's not as long as I feel like worshiping. No. All the days of my life, I have decided every week to be in the house of the Lord. David has already written in Psalm 23, verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's the only other time that, that expression is found in the Bible. All the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's a decision that he made. We are never too old for the thrill of worship. Neither are we too young for the thrill of worship. Ecclesiastes 12.1, when Solomon, with all of his riches and all of his knowledge, goes on a quest for the purpose of life, he is able to try so many things. And in the last chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, he comes to this conclusion. Remember the creator in the days of your youth. Youth need to be in worship while it can be in worship because when you get old, you can't always be in worship. Before the evil days come and the years draw nigh, we're never too old, we are never too young to be in worship. Then David talks about our duty. 
Our duty is to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. As I have said, the temple wasn't built yet when David wrote this. He had to inquire in the tabernacle because the temple had not yet been built. So the word temple here means a worship complex. It means a sanctuary. And for David, it probably referred to the tabernacle. Joyful worship branches out into two main streams. There is the meditation side, to behold the beauty of the Lord. We come to the temple to behold the beauty of the Lord, to worship him, to magnify his glory, to ponder God's kindness and pleasantness and delightfulness and beauty and favor and grace and power and all the other qualities of God. We come to meditate on those things and see, remind ourselves how great God is. And so that's one sign our side to behold the beauty of the Lord. But we also come to the, the temple for learning, to inquire in his temple. We come to church to seek, to inquire, to consider God in the temple. As I said, Solomon was a seeker after wisdom when he book, wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. In chapter 1, he admits that life has become a drag for him, and so he strikes out on this quest for meaning and purpose in life. He uh, admits that he can't find any satisfaction. The Rolling Stones had a hit song, Can't Get No Satisfaction. And there are many people that identify with that. Peggy Lee sang a song, Is That All There Is? Then let's just keep dancing. She had no other solution. And neither did Solomon when he started out to seek after the meaning and purpose of life. And while on the quest, he decides that the pursuit of happiness is not where it's at. And then he decides that the possession of things and wealth, which he had plenty of, is not the answer. And he decides that wisdom is not the answer, and he had a lot of wisdom. At last, he comes to the conclusion in chapter 12, the very last verse of the book of Ecclesiastes, the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God. And keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Worship is a duty for the believer. It is a duty. The Westminster Shorter Catechism says the chief end of man is to enjoy God or glorify God and enjoy him forever. I read the story of a shipwreck off the coast of the Pacific Northwest. A crowd of fishermen in a nearby village gathered to watch the ship as it was dashed against the rocks and as it began to break up. A lifeboat was sent out to the ship for the rescue, and after a terrific struggle, the rescuers came back with all of the, those that were on board, except there was no room in the lifeboat for one more person on that ship. And so that man was told to stay on the ship and someone would come back as soon as possible and so the young man came back, dropped off all the others, and he shouted, who is with me? Let's go rescue the other man. Come with me. And a little old lady cried out, don't go, Jim. Don't go. You are all I have left. Your father was drowned in the sea. Your brother William sailed away, and we've never heard from him since. Now, if you are lost, I'll be left all alone. Please don't go. The onlookers watched as the men in the lifeboat, including uh, Jim, went out to rescue this one last man on the shipwreck. Anxiously, Jim's mother wept and prayed. 
And then the boat started back. A frail little shell tossed about by the angry waves and last it became close enough that he could shout out to those on the shore. And they shouted, did you get him? Did you get him? And Jim shouted back, yes. And tell mother it's William. My question to you, think what might be missed when duty is ignored. Think what might be missed if our duty toward worship is ignored. Think what, by, what might be missed if we don't inquire of the Lord, where the Holy Spirit is witnessing to ultimate truth. What might be missed? Joyful worship is guaranteed when we keep coming back to the house of the Lord, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Worship is both a duty and a privilege. There's a little ditty that goes, some men die by shrapnel, some go down in flames. Most men perish inch by inch playing at little games. Folks, worship is no game. Worship is no game. It is the chief duty of mankind. Joyful worship doesn't just happen. It comes with a certain attitude. It comes from active participation and involvement in worship. You get nothing out of worship if you've put nothing in. Worship is a verb. It describes action. We tend to be too passive in our worship. David, the expert on worship, teaches us by saying one thing, determination. Have I asked of the Lord desire? That will I seek after decision that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, destination, all the days of my life, duration, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, duty, the chief duty of mankind. New Testament worship is just the same as Old Testament worship with one exception. And that is, the Lord has further revealed himself through his son, Jesus Christ, who humbled himself took the form of a man, was obedient unto death, willing to die on the cross for our sins. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that is what Worship 101 is all about. Father, we feel so inadequate as we come to your house and worship you week by week. Help us to absorb the, the uh, testimony of David this directive of David on how to worship. Help us to put these things into practice. May we be better worshipers <clears throat> that we might feel more confident being in your house, that we could raise our voices in song together in a corporate experience week by week as we've been instructed to do, as we have modeled from Jesus and also from the disciples. Help us in this respect, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.